summarize the second phase of the project uh, on conformal coating evaluation for improved environmental protection is to develop a uh, conformal coating evaluation test uh, method. Um, in fact, in phase one, we already established uh, uh, metrology and uh, uh, did some uh, validation test. Then uh, in the second phase, we um, compared with the other testing method. Um, so um, let's get started with, with uh, this uh, uh, project results. We will uh, do some sharing and uh, summarize. Okay. So for today's uh, webinar, uh, we will have several uh, speakers from the project team since it, this is a collaborative uh, effort. Um, for this project, we have uh, um, uh, PJ Sun from uh, IBM uh, is he's the uh, chair of this project, and uh, Chen Xu from Nokia is the co-chair. Um, uh, I am heading. Uh, I'm facilitating this project and work uh, together with the team. Okay, for just a couple words about the logistics of um, this webinar, uh, we will share the presentation material and also. Uh, we will start. Uh, we will record the webinar uh, that will be shared after, uh, probably in, uh, at the beginning of uh, June, uh, because we have another session um, scheduled. Um, so, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can use the chat uh, function to type in your question, and we will um, go through that uh, during the question and answer. Uh, also, we will open up uh, for discussion uh, during the Q&A. If you are not uh, speaking, you you can uh, mute yourself, um, and uh, during the discussion, you can unmute. Okay. I think that's um, um, the introduction I would like to give. Okay, let's get started. So, PJ, uh, I will pass to you to handle sure, the presentation. Thank, thank you, Haley. <clears throat> As Haley mentioned, this is a joint project. We have five speakers, myself, doctors, Buddhas, Meyer, Citrin, and Zo. So all five of us will uh, talk. And let me get started. So these are the companies and engineers involved in the project. <clears throat> so we can take a look at them. Let me give you a few more seconds. OK, now the agenda is that we'll talk about two convenient ways of testing conformal coatings. I'll describe them. <clears throat> then I'll describe the project objectives, the test conditions, and then the team will take over describing the terahertz time of flight tomography for thickness measurements and also some future work. And then we'll go into the meat of the presentation in terms of determining the thin film corrosion rates. <clears throat> results, conclusions, and Q&A. So uh, before this method that we will discuss here, the conventional method, it consists of conformally coating the actual hardware <coughs> with the conformal coating on the test, and then determining the mean time to failure of that coated hardware when exposed to corrosive environments. <coughs> So this conventional test takes a long time. It can take many months, up to a year. And also, uh, the test oftentimes it requires very high temperatures. And under those conditions, the conformal coating can behave very differently from that under the application temperature conditions. <clears throat> so the method we have for this presentation Let's call it the thin film method. In this, we take serpentine thin films of copper and silver, and we coat them with the conformal coating on the test. We then expose this coated thin films to a corrosive environment, and we measure the corrosion rates of the coated films. So if the conformal coating is perfect, the films will have zero corrosion rate. The advantage of this technique is it can be done in one week and it can be done at different temperatures 
and humidity levels. So the project objective, uh, let me first begin with what we did in phase one. In phase one, we developed the technique using flowers of sulfur and humidity as a corrosive environment. <clears throat> so phase one is successful, but flowers of sulfur is not the industry standard uh, corrosive environment for testing electron electronic hardware. <clears throat> It's mixed flowing gas environment. That's this industry standard. So in phase two, we are comparing the flowers of sulfur results with those we will get in the mixed flowing gas environment. And also we include the iodine vapor environment as the third environment in this test. So we're comparing three environments, see how they perform in evaluating conformal coatings. So here is a, a viable plot showing what's the problem with the conventional method. So in this viable plot, the resistors, surface mount resistors, they were coated with uh, different coatings, and then they were subjected to 105 degrees centigrade in a flowers of sulfur environment. And you can see from the viable plot that the coated uh, resistors fail earlier than the control. And this is only because this test is done at 105 degrees C compared to the application temperature of let's say 40 degrees C. So the conformal coating tested at 105 degrees C has no bearing to how it perform at let's say 40 degrees C. So in, in our test, the thin film method, we're testing at low temperatures of 30 to 40 degrees C. So here are the conditions for the test. So to develop the test, we use three coatings, acrylic, fluorinated acrylic, and, acryl and atomic layer deposited films. So the idea was to get a range of uh, properties of conformal coatings for testing purposes. Uh, the flowers of sulfur environment shown in the table on the left, the temperature was 40 degrees centigrade and uh, the and we used different humidity levels uh, of 10 percent, 32 percent and 75 percent. And uh, in the case of the mixed flowing gas environment, showing on the table on the right, the, the gases were at 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, but in all this testing, we were able to heat the samples to different temperatures by joule heating. So even though the ambient was 30 degrees C for mixed flowing gas test, it was 40 degrees C for uh, flowers of sulfur test, we could raise the temperature of the conformal coating to whatever temperature we desired by joule heating. So that's another powerful uh, advantage of this technique. Now, let me hand over the presentation to Dr. Meyer. He'll discuss the RD in vapor test. Thank you, PJ. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening also from my side. Yes, the iodine vapor test, uh, we developed it around three years ago and uh, the target was to develop a test which is very fast, very easy to perform and also um, yeah, give a good quality statement on um, coding quality. Uh, in the end, it's for coatings, for portings, but also for mold compounds applicable. Um, it's a very easy approach, so you only need a closed a glass or also vessel, a heater and a saturated iodine sol um, solution. Um, the component is put into the closed chamber, you heat up the saturated iodine solution and the iodine gas uh, is formed by the high temperature. If you use some temperature of around 60 degrees C, like shown here, 
you will get a, a yodium vapor temperature of around 40 degrees C and a relative humidity of about 100%. Regarding the duration of the test, as I mentioned before, it's a very uh, quick test. So in the end, 30 minutes to 60 minutes are enough for most of the common coding materials to test. If you use it for porting materials, for example, you will need to uh, uh, extend the test to duration to uh, from 60 to around two or three hours. The optical inspection is done by uh, the inspection is done by optical microscopy uh, and you have a um, yeah, qualitative evaluation of the surface after the testing. Um, I mentioned before it's a fast quality test to identify on the one hand side cracks and penetration pathways in the protective system like coatings, pottings and also molds, but also to uh, locate the adhesion weed spots between the assembly surface and the coating, potting or mold material, but also to discover and to localize edge covering issues on the assembly surface. So far from my side, and I will hand over to Marco from Picasan. Yes, thank you. So one uh, coating method along the many in this uh, project has been atomically a position which we are doing at Picosan, and it is a gas phase coating method in vacuum where the samples uh, can be 3D coated, including all of the cavities independent of the locations and, and the orientation. As you can see, uh, see here, these samples being loaded to the basket. So the process is that um, samples are, are loaded in and the uh, uh, basket is being uh, lowered and uh, evacuated to vacuum. Samples are heated up and then uh, pulses of ILD, uh, the position cycles are run on the samples. Then it's been cooled down and finally it's been vented, vented to an ambient. Dr. Citrant. All right, thank you. <clears throat> So now I want to talk about some of our work, which is a little bit exploratory. And let me just start by showing the samples, the, the same ones we've seen before. Um, I'm just going to show results for one of them, this number 17. So basically, we're using terahertz electromagnetic radiation as a non-destructive probe of, the, uh, of what's below the coating. So uh, is the metallization becoming corroded? or is there damage in the coating itself, and also to measure the coating thickness. So we're exploring the use of terrorist uh, probes as some sort of uh, metrological tool uh, to support the project. Okay, so next slide, please. Who has control? Thank you. So the technique we're using, well, I'll talk about two. One is called terahertz time of flight tomography. So on the right, uh, basically, uh, what I want to focus on is the small uh, coating uh, sub metallic substrate. Well, that's a recycled slide, but the idea is some sort of uh, substrate or material with a coating. A single cycle terahertz pulse comes in, there's a reflection, and the reflected signal is made up of echoes that occur at the various uh, interfaces in this layered structure. So by knowing something about the material, and measuring the time delay between the two echoes, we can learn about uh, the thickness of that layer, for example. So on the bottom right is an example just schematically showing uh, what we're doing. So we have the conformal coating. Underneath the coating, we either have SiO2 or the serpentine film. Okay, so uh, next, please. So before we do the time of flight tomography, let me just show you some images, uh, multispectral images that we can obtain by looking at different frequency bands uh, within the bandwidth of our experiment. So since we're working with quasi single cycle terahertz pulses, the bandwidth is large. So if we Fourier transform our pulses, the uh, power spectrum goes from a few tens of gigahertz up to about three gigahertz. Now, uh, some of what you see is uh, the, the deep absorptions in the spectrum are water vapor absorption lines, which we can correct for because they're known 
they're reproducible. The little wiggles you see is just due to uh, our FFT, so we, we can do better than that. And then notice on the right above around three terahertz, that's, that's noise, that's basically the noise floor. So you can see that uh, in the middle of the, of the band or towards the high, around two terahertz, at the higher frequencies, still above the noise floor, we have rather high resolution. We can carry out high resolution imaging. We can present the results in various ways. So these images are obtained from the peak reflected signal. But we can also time window uh, the signal to obtain an image. And that gives us the depth of where the reflection is coming from. So we can uh, basically get rid of the surface reflection and focus on the reflection from the bottom of the conformal coating, et cetera. So uh, these sorts of images we're currently looking at in more detail to see if we can uh, detect incipient corrosion formation uh, on the metallization before it's uh, visually evident. So next slide, please. Now, time of flight tomography is that experiment again where we send a pulse onto the surface and we look at the echoes. So in the upper left is an example of a reflected signal uh, from a single pulse. So on the upper right is a reference pulse, a single pulse produced by the apparatus. On the left are reflected pulses from the sample. So the red case is when the, uh, the pulse is incident on, an, on, a, on a place where the conformal coating is over metal. Uh, case two, the black curve or dark blue curve, is where the pulse is incident at a point between the serpentine film. So there's some differences you see. What we're going to focus on is the first peak there. The second peak, big peak that you see, is a reflection from the bottom of the SiO2 layer. We want to focus on that first peak because in that first peak are actually two echoes uh, overlapping in time. Next, please. So the red curves that you see are the experimental data. So here we're focusing on that first big peak, uh, the, the peak around uh, an optical delay of uh, 14 picoseconds in both cases. Let's not look at the peak at around 30 on the right. Now, because the duration of the peak is comparable to the time delay between the two echoes, the echoes overlap. So we use a deconvolution technique, a signal processing technique, to extract where those the two echoes are centered in time. So the reconstruction by means of sparse deconvolution is shown in black. And it's hard to see here, but uh, those red big echoes or big signal at about 14 or 15 picosecond are actually two echoes with a very small time delay between them. So because we know that acrylic has a refractive index of about 1.5, we can use that information and the speed of light to measure the thickness of the conformal coating. So next, please. So here, it's a bit hard to see. These are three cases. If you look at each of those images on top, there's a black line. So on the left, the line runs across the serpentine film. In the middle, it runs parallel to the serpentine film, but on top of the metal. And on the right, it runs parallel to the serpentine film, but between the metallization. So what we're showing here are the thicknesses of the um, conformal coating uh, as along those cross sections. So uh, the conformal coating in this case is around 50 microns thick. Uh, but we also see in, in spe specifically in the left hand panel we can see that there's a difference in the thickness of the acrylic over the metal and between the metal. In fact, it's somewhat thicker over the metal. And I'm not an expert at the uh, formation of these films, but uh, that may be tied to issues associated with the wetting uh, of the metal versus the SiO2 between it uh, with the, um, when, the, when the acrylic is applied or with geometric effects. So that's also... Uh, under investigation. On the other hand, when we look at the sections parallel to the conformal coating, to the serpentine film, we see that the thickness is rather uniform. So, uh, next, please. 
Okay, so, so that's that's point, it for me. So yeah, so sorry. Uh, this, at this point, I can take over. <clears throat> so the metal thin film test setup is explained here. <clears throat> Essentially, we have a silicon oxide on silicon dye. On top of that, we plate the serpentine thin film. Uh, we attach a thermocouple, very micro wired thermocouple to measure the temperature of the conformal coating. Uh, and we, on the right side, it's just connections, electrical connections for four point measurement. This photograph on the left basically shows what the specimen looks like from the top. <clears throat> so this whole thing is coated with the conformal coating and that the corrosion rate of the thin film is measured in a corrosive gas environment. So these are just some details of the test setup. Uh, the point to note is that uh, this picture on the top right, the tray has sulfur in it. That's what gives the sulfur vapor. And then the inner tray has saturated salt solution that controls the relative humidity in the chamber. The middle left picture just shows the setup, what it looks like inside. Middle right is what the specimens look like. And the bottom right shows a magnified view of the serpentine silver thin film with the thermocouple attached to it. <laughs> Uh, we ran this chamber at 40 degrees centigrade <coughs> and different humidities. <coughs> the way we measure the thin film resistance is by the four point technique. We pump known current through the serpentine thin film and we measure the voltage across it. And all this is done by data loggers. So they, they measure the current through the film and the voltage across the film. And we can also use the setup for joule heating. If you pump more current, the specimen will get hot and we can measure the temperature using a micro thermocouple. So this table is uh, very important. It explains how we measure corrosion rate of thin films. The top right chart is just temperature versus time. So horizontal axis goes from zero to 120 hours. And notice that uh, each day we are running at a different temperature. So we can have different temperatures by means of joule heating. Now, this picture on the top right, these curves should be flat, but they have a slope because the samples are corroding. So the I square R keeps on increasing, so joule heating keeps increasing. OK, so we can measure the resistance of the film versus on time. And we notice there's a jog in this uh, plot of this, this bottom left plot. The jog is because we're changing the temperature. When you change the temperature, the resistance also changes. <clears throat> But we want to use the temporal resistance to measure thickness. So we take this plot on the left and we say, OK, what would this plot look like if the film was cool to room temperature? So that's the compound, the corrected resistance shown in the bottom middle plot. So once we have the corrected resistance of a film, we can then measure how much silver corroded. And that's the plot on the right. So notice, uh, and from the slope of this plot, we can measure corrosion rate at different temperatures. So just a sidebar, when we run corrosion chambers, we want to make sure that they are under control. So one way to understand the control of a chamber to see how well it's controlled is to measure the corrosion rate of uh, pieces of metal we place in the chamber or thin films. So the red plot, the red plots of a mixed flowing gas at 30 degrees C, 
and plot on the left is silver corrosion. The one on the right is copper corrosion. And the dotted, what's the difference between dotted and solid curves? The dotted curves are for thin films and the solid curves are for metal foils. So in general, thin films will corrode faster than foils because thin films have finer grain size, high stress. Anyway, so I just want to show this chart that these are the, this is the corrosion rate of silver and copper in these chambers. And it says a function of relative humidity. Okay, so back to our corrosion data. So here's an example of silver corrosion rate on the left and copper corrosion rate on the right. And this is in flowers of sulfur chamber at 32% RH, 40 degrees C. Notice that, oh, and the vertical axis is silver corroded for the chart on the left and the amount of copper corroded is the chart on the right and the horizontal axis is hours. So we're looking at corrosion as a function of time and the slope of these lines is corrosion rate. Now notice that the chart on the left and if you compare that to the chart on the right, the corrosion of acrylic, of fluorinated acrylic and ALD is much less for copper than for silver. In other words, the acrylic, the fluorinated acrylic and the atomic lead deposited films, they're protecting the copper much better than they're protecting silver. And this might have something to do with adhesion. <clears throat> so this is a plot from the flowers of sulfur chamber. Now here's a plot from the mixed flowing gas chamber. So the title doesn't say it, but this is a mixed flowing gas chamber. Again here, notice that the acrylic, the fluorinated acrylic and the ALD, they are protecting copper much better than they're protecting silver. For example, if you look on the chart on the right, the all these colored plots except the blue, they're very close to the axis, whereas on the left, which is silver corrosion, we're getting sizable rates of silver corrosion. So again, the mixed flowing gas chamber results also show that these coatings we tested protect copper much better than silver. Okay, so with these charts that have amount of corrosion versus time, from the slopes of the plots, we can get corrosion rates and we can plot them versus inverse of temperature. So the chart on the right is silver corrosion rate on a log scale and the horizontal axis is the inverse of absolute temperature. <clears throat> so this way we can summarize everything on the chart on the left in terms of Arrhenius plot. So now let me show you our results. <clears throat> so this is a case of testing done in flowers of sulfur chamber at 75% RH and 40 degrees C. So you see the bare silver is in blue and the bare copper, the left plot is the silver corrosion rate, the right plot is copper corrosion rate and the horizontal axis is the inverse of temperature. So these are Arrhenius plots and you can see that the chart on the right, the acrylic, the fluorinated acrylic and the LD, they have, they are they are protecting copper better than silver. So, on, so I mean that's in general. Uh, so this is at 75% RH. At 32% RH, again the same thing. The the three coatings are protecting copper better than they protect silver. And this last one is at 10% RH. In, in flower and sulfur chamber at 40 degrees C. Now here, if you look at, at the chart on the right, the green plot is for atomic lead deposited on top of copper. So this uh, plot we have to discount because we had some issues 
with cleaning the substrate before we put the atomic red deposit. And we will show with our iodine vapor test that when we corrected the problem, ALD did, did an excellent job of protecting the underlying metals. <clears throat> but if you see for acrylic and for fluorinated acrylic, they're protecting copper better than silver. So on that note, I'm going to hand it to Chenzu to discuss the mixed flowing gas results. Hi, Chen. <clears throat> Thank you, PJ. I thought you're going to do that too. That's OK. So I guess uh, uh, in the mixed flowing gas testing, we get the very similar result as the flower of sulfur testing. And what you see here is again the Arrhenius plug for testing done at different RH. And in this particular one is at 70% of RH. And on the left hand side, you see the result for silver. And on the right hand side, for copper. Again, as PJ has uh, mentioned before, in our testing, the Conformal coating in our case seems to provide a better protection for copper than for silver, and most likely due to the better adhesion on copper, and which is also known in the industry. And uh, it's some it's kind of difficult to get a good adhesion on silver. And next slide, please. And here you see the result for 34% of RH. And uh, you again see very similar result as the flow of sulfur testing. Mm -hmm. And next slide, please. And that's the result at 10% RH. Next slide. I will turn over back to PJ. On this slide. Okay, so this slide compares. Uh, so this is an optical observation of the coatings after they have been through the mixed flowing gas and the flour sulfur test. So if you look at the top row, so that's results for flour sulfur test and. Uh, <clears throat> So the left slide is for bare copper. The next one is acrylic coated copper. Third one is fluorinated, fluorinated acrylic coated copper. Last one is atomic layer deposited copper. So you can see the atomic layer deposition does the best protection. The fluorinated is next best and the acrylic is not as good as fluorinated acrylic. Uh, now these pictures, they don't do justice, but when you look under the microscope, it becomes more clear. Again, for MFT results, the ALD did the best job, and then the fluorinated and the acrylic, but it's not quite obvious from these pictures because when we take pictures, they don't look as good as when you actually observe them. And now this is for the case of silver uh, coupons, Again, you, if you look at the last column, that's for atomic layer deposition on silver. Uh, ALD protects silver and copper, uh, silver very well, both in FOS and MFG. And fluorinated is next best. Acrylic is not as good. So again, as I mentioned, these charts don't do justice to the actual samples. In, in this and uh, when they're photographed. So let me now transfer the presentation of Dr. Meyer to discuss IVD test. Thank you again. Yeah, for the Yoda and Vapor test, we uh, made an optical assessment of the samples. So on the left hand side, you have the column before the testing, then the middle column is after 30 minutes testing, and the right column is after another 30 minutes 
um, also testing of the same sample, so in total 60 minutes testing time. Uh, remember the iodine vapor test condition, so 40 degrees C for the iodine vapor at around 100% relative um, humidity. So in the end, the iodine vapor test, it's a kind of HAST test, so a highly accelerated stress test by using the iodine vapor in combination with humidity, but also temperature. Um, regarding the comparison with the MFG but and the flow of sulfur testing, I can say that the results from the iodine vapor test fits quite well to the other test results. So in general here, the um, results for the silver um, substrate, though after 30 minutes, um, for the acrylic coated samples, we saw um, nearly total co um, corrosion here, which was not uh, enhanced after the second 30 minutes testing time. The fluorinated acrylic one performed better, though you see at the, uh, from the color of the 30 minutes, it's cor corroded, but not so deeply corroded than with the acrylic coating. What you also can see for this sample, um, the iodine and vapor test results are dependent from layer thickness of the fluorinated acrylic coating at the lower right side. You see this splash for the fl um, fluorinated acrylic coating there. The layer is thicker and after 30 minutes testing time in this area, the corrosion, uh, yeah, uh, there was no corrosion in this um, area, whereas after another 30 minutes, also this um, area with the thicker layer thickness of the fluorinated acrylic coating was totally corroded. ALD coating, as with the other tests, um, performed best. So you clearly see after 30 minutes, but also after 60 minutes testing time, nearly no corrosion could be observed. So it fits quite well to the other test results. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, for the copper samples, we also saw that um, the uh, copper corrosion was less than for the silver with the coated samples. For the acrylic one, um, after 30 minutes, you see a slightly um, whitish, let's say, film on the copper surface, is, uh, being the copper iodide formed during the de testing. After another 30 minutes, you see that the substrate or the copper on the substrate is quite um, white in color, so uh, very much copper iodide formed on this sample means that you have um, a total corrosion here um, on this copper with the acrylic uh, coating after 60 minutes. The copper fluorinated acrylic um, performed slightly better, but also here, depending on the layer thickness, you see areas with uh, very less corrosion after 60 minutes, especially at the lower right side and in the upper middle area. Um, all the areas with a white color here, the layer thickness was a bit thinner. And after 60 minutes, you see corrosion in these areas. Yeah, they, they thank you for showing it, PJ. Um, as PJ also, also mentioned before, for the um, copper ALD, coding at the first test, there went something wrong with the cleanliness of the sample. So in the end, uh, for this, you see a very inhomogeneous corrosion of the surface. You see areas after 30 minutes completely corroded, so white in color, but also areas which is pretty good protected. So here we had a very inhomogeneous performance of the ALD coding. Um, Yes, uh, PJ mentioned it, there was something wrong with the uh, copper surface and also cleanliness of the sample. Therefore, we uh, did a cleaning prior to the ALD coding and please use the next slide. Yes, thank you. Um, I need to mention before that we did it only with this um, um, copper substrate, not soldered, uh, no um, gluing performed, so only the pure 
um, copper substrate, but then cleaned before the ALD coding, you see that even after 60 minutes, ALD coding performed extremely good, though no cor um, corrosion at all uh, was um, or, or could have been detected after 60 minutes testing time. Good, thank you. Then the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, just a short summary regarding the Yoda vapor test results. As I mentioned before, in general, um, the um, protected silver substrate uh, were corroded more than for the copper. So also we saw this for the mixed flow and gas testing and uh, the flow of sulfur testing. Moreover, um, ALT coding performed best then the fluorinated acrylic one and the worst one was the acrylic coating. Okay, so far from my side and I will hand over back to PJ for the conclusions. Thank you. Thanks. So our conclusions are that silver corrosion rates, I'm sorry, corrosion rates of coated silver were higher, were higher than those of coated copper. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, the three, so I'm sorry, the the corrosion rates of, uh, yeah, that's correct, sorry, yeah. And the three tests, uh, the flower sulfur mixed flowing gas and iodine vapor test, they agreed in their characterization of the coatings with acrylic being not as good as fluorinated acrylic and the ALD being the best. So in conclusion, we can say that the flower sulfur and the mixed flowing gas environments, they are, they are quantitatively in agreement when it comes to testing conformal coatings. So either one can be used. And the iodine vapor test is also in agreement, but qualitatively, because we didn't use the idea and vapor test for quantitative measurements. So in summary, all three environments, they've worked well. Now going back to the first bullet, I also want to say that as a sidebar, that when you examine an environment from a corrosion point of view, and in that environment, you put metal foils and metal thin films, the metal thin films will corrode faster than metal foils. That's because thin films have finer grain size compared to metal foils, and they also are highly stressed. Uh, so with that, let me conclude and open up for questions. Okay, thank you, PJ. And all uh, the thanks, speakers. So we have uh, uh, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one is about um, the ARD. Um, uh, it's asking if ARD is similar to parallel coating. I think uh, maybe, uh, Michael, you want to comment? Yeah. So um, ALD is typically used to deposit uh, uh, thin film much thinner than parallel in vacuum reactors like CVD. However, ALD uh, films are, are thinner and they are typically made of um, metal oxides, ceramics. So in performance wise in, in metal uh, trade in the water vapor transfer properties, they are much better than parallel. ALD is a subclass of the CVD. Uh, CVD creates uh, some uh, 3D features, whereas ALD is extremely good in, in 3D features and extremely high aspect ratios. Okay, I hope it answered the question. And another question is about the MFG test condition. Um, I guess the question is more about the combination of different uh, corrosive gases. Uh, Chen, you want to comment on this? Yeah, we, for this particular testing, we use the NAPES outdoor condition in the TR-63 
and the, the concentration is uh, sulfur dioxide at 200 ppb, hydrogen sulfide at 100 ppb, and uh, uh, NOx at 200 ppb, and the chlorine at 20 ppb. Okay, thank you. I think, yeah, the, the temperature we mentioned, it's um, at a 30 centigrade, I think. Okay. Uh, a question from Jeffrey. Um, in addition, picture shown to compare corrosion, is there resistance change after various methods for comparison? I think uh, we only did um, uh, resistance monitoring for uh, FOS and um, uh, mixed flowing gas. So, PJ or Chen, you want to comment? Yeah, you're right. We only did the resistance measurements on FOS and mixed flowing gas, but it can also be done for iodine vapor test. Resistance change can be done, definitely, with the same yes. technique. Maybe Dr. Yeah, so, can yeah, so um, we started with the optical assessment first, but of course, uh, for the next step, um, uh, a quantitative measurement uh, would be good to really compare the corrosion rates here. Yes, it's possible. So, are there any other questions? So that's a question we received. From the chat. So, if you have any question, you can also uh, unmute yourself. I think it's a question for me in the chat. Um, yeah. Is okay, there yeah. all danger in operating iodine vapor? So, um, in general, um, you should operate this test under a fume hood. Um, iodine is not so dangerous and reactive as, for example, bromide, chlorine gas, or H2S gas. But uh, and also, um, iodine at room temperature, it's a solid element. So after cooling down, the iodine vapor re-sublimates at the glass uh, or the um, um, reaction um, um, chamber, and then it's not in the gas phase, uh, gas phase anymore. Nevertheless, if some uh, remaining iodine vapor uh, is um, going out of the uh, reaction chamber then by a normal chemical uh, lab fume hood uh, um, um, it can be used quite well and it's very very safe and easy to handle Hello, this is uh, Vijay from Nokia. I had a question uh, about uh, the environmental impacts of fluorinated acrylic versus just acrylic. So, Haley, there's nobody from the deposition companies on this call, right? No. Mo Mo Molly's not on the call? Okay. So we can get back to you with an answer. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, it was just that if we start uh, using the fluorinated ones uh, much more uh, than than uh, are are there laws that'll eventually are there laws already that'll prevent that, uh, or or is that is there is there another impact that we should consider? Yes, yeah, so the, the coatings we, we use, they are commercially available and are being used. Correct. OK. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure, sorry. OK, so okay, there is a question about uh, the sickness. I think uh, there was a slide, PJ, uh, telling the the thickness uh, of three different uh, coatings, acrylic, that's uh, silicon, 
and uh, ARD that's from phase one. Um, so he wonder if the thickness of uh, what's the thickness of the uh, fluorinated uh, acrylic. Right, uh, I don't recall what it is, but we can get back. Uh, let me maybe I quickly check. Uh, oh, okay. okay. No, I see Molly accepted the meeting. I think so. The order of just a few microns. Yeah, that's what I two, remember. Two, two microns. range. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah, for acrylic and uh, uh, ARD, the thickness is the same as in phase one. Yeah, I think uh, for the uh, fluorinated acrylic, it's as uh, PG said, probably um, like uh, uh, from one micron uh, to several micron. But right, correct. we will we will confirm with yeah our team member. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so if not, I think uh, we will uh, close today's session. Oh, there is uh, another one. Okay, yeah, uh, I think it's a more uh, a comment. Uh, yeah, A yes, ARD, uh, the, the cost is, uh, is uh, higher, I would say. Michael, you want to comment? Well, it's not exactly highest because of the low cost of the chemicals. So based on the information I gathered from the industry, it is uh, somewhere in between of the silicon polymer and between the barrel and effectively much, much cheaper than barrel and. Okay. Any additional comments or questions? Okay, if not, then we will close today's session. Thank you all for joining. I think uh, there are a couple of questions we will confirm and get back, okay? Uh, I believe we have your contact information, okay? So we will uh, share the presentation material and also the uh, recording, um, but it will be, um, I, I would uh, guess, around the, the 10th of June because we have another session scheduled on the 8th of June. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, PJ. Thank uh, Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Ariel. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.